Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to Eccentric Mold Engineering's webinar. If you're here for overmolding, then you're in the right place. I'm Connie, and I'll be your host for this session. A few things to cover before I turn over the webinar to our keynote speakers today. This presentation is expected to last approximately 30 minutes. Q&A is included during the presentation, so feel free to submit your questions using the chat function located in the lower right control panel. If you run out of time before the questions are answered, we'll follow up by sending you an email with the answers to the questions. Uh, with that, I now turn over our webinar to our keynote speakers, John Sidorowitz <coughs> and Glenn Miller. John and Glenn, please tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Glenn Miller. I'm the tooling engineer here at Eccentric. I've been here about a year and a half, about 25 years of uh, injection molding design and build experience. Excuse me. Uh, my name is John Sigurowitz and getting over a cold right now, so excuse me. Um, I oversee the um, inside sales team here and the project managers. Um, have about 15 years of injection molding experience. And um, just want to thank everyone for uh, joining today. Um, so with that, let's get started. <clears throat> so on the agenda for today, we'll cover uh, the following. Um, kind of why injection molding. Um, and what is overmolding, and then getting into some overmold examples of, of some parts, um, feature specifications, um, looking at material or evaluating materials for, for overmolding, um, and then kind of focusing on the uh, inefficiencies of substrates, um, getting into surface finishes, and then and file prep for uh, quotation uh, with us. So first, why choose injection molding? Um, there's many reasons. We've highlighted a few here. Um, kind of the, the product development timeline, kind of shortening that. There's a lot of tools now, uh, DFM tools uh, like Moldflow and, and others uh, that we use here that can shorten the time to, uh, you know, uh, getting from prototype to, to injection molding. Uh, you can do accurate detailed features and parts uh, where you may not get with 3D printing or other processes, um, tight tolerances. Um, and repeat those. Um, your iteration cycle, so you know, uh, moving from you know Rev A to Rev B, uh, that can be done quickly. Uh, you have flexibility not in only your types of molds, but your types of materials, types of colors that you can run within that same mold. And of course, cost savings. Um, it may be a, a large upfront cost or, or a decent size, but in the end, uh, your piece price will be much cheaper just due to uh, the nature of the process and again repeatability uh, and scaling up too as well so you know you can start with a single cavity tool scale up as as uh, the product sells and, and move into a bridge tool or a production tool multi-cavity tool things like that and as well as multiple finishes on a part so um, you're not tied to you know one finish so you can have a polish area textured area and things like that so um. Uh, just to go through uh, a basic tooling, um, our tools really start with a really good part design, taking into account nominal wall thicknesses, uh, uh, the end game as far as what the finished product is going into. Uh, your, your basic tool has a, a cavity half and a core half of the tool that come together. Um, molten plastic is injected into the tool and the mold splits and your part comes out at the end. So next, what is overmolding? So you're essentially taking a, a substrate, which is the first shot, uh, as you see on the left there, uh, which is normally going to be a, a harder material, um, and then taking that shot, inserting into another mold, and doing the second shot or the overmold, and the outcome is that assembly on the far right there. And that substrate can be uh, either an injected, injected molded part that we build the tool for that and run first. Um, you can also over mold various different materials, steel, uh, any type of substrate that needs some sort of uh, cover on it. We can over mold that as well. It does not have to be plastic. It can be any material. Um, and we do many of those here. Yeah, we do have another webinar on that uh, insert molding, which will be uh, we'll do later this year. So. Um, 
So again, continuing on to, to what is overmolding. So again, you're combining two different materials, two different plastics, um, you know, colors and, and the reasons to do this, you can add color contrasts, um, add like a soft grip surface. Um, you can add flexibility to a rigid part in some areas where you need some, some flexibility, uh, eliminate assemblies, um, you know, taking two parts and having someone put them together. Um, or, you know, to capture a part within another part without having to use fastener or, or adhesives. Um, and, I mean, there's a wide range of materials that are capable of, capable of being overmolded, uh, including both in soft, uh, hard and soft plastics. And we have a good uh, image there that uh, we have uh, good practices in design features for the substrates. Anytime you're trying to overmold a uh, one material over another. It's always good to plan ahead and provide within the substrate design um, features, holes, reservoirs, any kind of area that will help hold on to that substrate material and keep it bonded to the actual substrate. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so you want a good chemical bond. Um, in most, you know, most cases you can get that, but you do want to have that, um, that physical uh, locking bond as well. And, and determining uh, the two different materials, it's always good to get uh, an expert uh, opinion from uh, the material suppliers, technicians, engineers. Uh, they can help a lot with the specifics on what materials bond the best together. Some don't bond as well to others. Other finishes don't bond well to certain materials and so forth and so on. So those are all things that you have to look out for when you're designing an overmold. So going to design considerations, uh, we'll talk about materials, how to evaluate your materials, um, feature specifications, uh, look at surface finishes, and then file prep. So we've got a part example here. So the green part is the substrate, while the uh, the gray uh, area is what was overmolded onto the part. Um, so obviously the green part was shot first, was loaded into another tool, and then the uh, the gray uh, material was shot over it. And the next page will kind of show a little section view. This is pre um, pre overmold, so you can see the area um, cleared out to uh, accept the overmold. Um, we have three little holes through there. Those are those locking features for the material to flow in through and, and lock onto the part, uh, as well as the material is a, a, a match to the substrate material for a chemical bond. And we, you know, just some things to highlight on here, you know, where the overmold meets the substrate, we have a, a, a nice clean shut off uh, all the way around. Um, this transition here from thick to thin uh, is in a hard corner, we have a radius in there. Um, so, um, these are all good design features. Anything you want to add, Glenn? Well, I think this looks good. Any, again, any kind of feature like those holes, <laughs> those are there to make sure that there's some place for that sub, uh, that overmold material to go and kind of lock that into the substrate itself. Another example here, this one is actually a, um, a double overmold. So the uh, substrate button, the blue part and the uh, green part were the substrate. So those were loaded into a tool and the red part um, was shot and is the overmold and um, in, in the end it produced a uh, actuating button so there's no assembly on the customer's part they got you know this half of the housing ready to go um, you know loaded up all their uh, internals and, and closed it up in this particular instance the uh, the overmold provides a, a seal for that Correct. button um, so that's the reason for the hard button and then the overmold material as well on this piece Good point. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, wall thickness. Um, just with any injection molded part, you want to have a good nominal wall thickness. It's just going to provide good flow throughout the part, uh, even shrink. Um, yeah, you want to avoid any thin areas. You want to avoid any sharp corners, anything that will pinch that material. Depending on the material, some flow better than others. Uh, you always want to follow best practices when you're designing your overmold piece to your substrate. And again, when you're designing for uh, the overmold, make sure the uh, the wall thickness um, that you're designing for will work with that overmold material. A lot of rubbers have a minimum wall thickness, 35, 40 thousandths. 
when you start getting thinner to that, you may run into fill issues um, and things like that. So just be uh, aware of that. Okay, and here's, uh, as we mentioned, um, along with thickness of part, uh, these materials for injection molding do not like sharp corners, do not like 90 degrees or any type of abrupt transitions. The material flows much better if you have a smooth transition when, when it's a, uh, possible on your design. Certainly rads are always recommended in any area, no sharp corners. Um, and just keep a nice nominal wall thickness. And as John mentioned before, um, that wall thickness is really uh, dictated by the material itself. Some materials flow better through thinner areas, some do not. That's really something you have to be cognizant of as you're designing your parts. All right, sub gates, gate locations. <laughs> um, you know, when designing the overmold, we want to make sure, I mean, most of the time it's cosmetic, so we don't want any gate vestige or anything showing on the surface. So uh, we have to think about when we're designing how we're going to gate it or where material is going to enter those cavities where we're going to fill with uh, the overmold material. Um, things to think about using through holes to access, you know, from the core side, as you kind of see in the image there, um, and those double as mechanical holes, um, you know, subgating through there. Um, again, if you have multiple areas that um are going to get overmold again you may need to have feeder paths or um runners uh, different types of blind runner areas uh, that can flow from sometimes you have interrupted areas that are uh, overmolded like on a hand grip <coughs> things like that so you're going to need a track from the main sprue, the main gate, to make sure you hit all of those areas. That you're, you're not always able to flow that material across the entire substrate. Okay. Um, on this one, uh, for shutoffs, uh, again, always want to make sure you have a nice, clean, uh, it doesn't always have to be flat, but a nice, clean edge for a shutoff because the tool maker is basically taking that substrate part and using that uh, to fit the overmold piece. Sometimes it takes a couple iterations to get that shut off right and avoid any issues with flash and so forth. So you always have to be cognizant of where the uh, overmold piece, uh, whether it's a groove or just a, a sharp edge, have to make sure that you have those in there so that this overmold can <laughs> flow properly and hold into that substrate. Nope. Uh, on to materials. Uh, utilize data sheets. There's a lot of information on the web. Uh, a couple good websites, um, you know, Prospector uh, and Matt Web. Uh, you can review, uh, search materials, um, and they should advise if they're good for overmolding and, and what materials they um, they bond with. Uh, typical materials for uh, Substrates are going to be ABS, uh, PCABS, polycarbonates, and, and some nylons. Um, other materials that are going to be tough to uh, overmold are going to be polypros, uh, HDPEs, LDPEs, and acetals, just due to the natural lubricity of that material. Uh, getting material to bond to that is going to be difficult. Um, and that's really regardless of sometimes polishes and, and textures help you with that. As John mentioned, these uh, the polypros and the polyethylenes and so forth are difficult, <coughs> whether it's polished or not, just uh, as far as adhesion. And for your second shots, you know, just looking at durometer versus the, the flexural mod modulus, excuse me. Um, and again, just use, utilize the data sheets. Um, there's a lot of materials out there. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, you really don't want to run a material that's that runs hotter than the substrate um, melt temp. Um, you know, if you, you run a material that's hotter than the melt temp, then you could actually deform your substrate during the overmolding process, which doesn't do any good. And, and any time with choosing materials, I always suggest if there's if there's any concerns to to get on the phone uh, or meet with a, a material uh, technician engineer. Um, they do this every day. 
um, and they can always help you with any type of uh, concerns with uh, adhesion and, and can match you up on materials as well as uh, you know, doing your own research with the data sheets. Yeah, and we can help, uh, you know, make that happen, um, introduce you to some uh, material engineers. Um, so consistency within the overmolding process is going to rely on a consistent substrate. So, um, you know, what we mean by that is, you know, warp parts, um, you know, parts that aren't packed out, parts that are possibly a little short, any deviation from the way a, a substrate's processed can affect the shrink, which can make the fit into the overmold change. Right. It has to, consistency is the word. You, you have to have a consistent substrate in order to run an overmold successfully. Right. So if you have a, a substrate that, you know, has a lot of thick to thin transitions, you may see some inconsistent shrink or, along that, which, like Glenn had said, is, is, is going to be difficult to overmold and, and, you know, get those tight shutoffs. Um, it just may lead to flashing, um, shorting, and, and other things. Um, and then again, oh, concentricity yeah. matters. You know, oblong round parts are going to be problematic because we're they're not round. So um, it's it, those are difficult to to overmold. Ah, surface finishes. Um, we look at uh, whether we put a uh, what we call a B three, which is a basic. Uh, rough polished 320 paper or some type of bead blast with uh, with a media of some sort um, those range from very light to we can go very heavy on a texture depending on your application um, some polishes will stick um, on, the overmold. on the overmold itself um, again it, depending on the material uh, you have to dial in what type of texture what type of polish uh, you should be applying to that And then we do have these texture plaques available to anyone that wants them. Um, you can just send us an email at sales at eccentric mold. Um, it just shows our, our standard um, finishes and textures in different materials and colors. Um, we'd be happy to send that out. So for file preparation for quoting, um, you will need three files. Um, two separate files for the substrate and the overmold and then the assembly file with them together. Uh, as separate bodies. So kind of brings us towards the end here. Um, evaluate your materials, do your research, check data sheets, make sure the, the materials are, you're going to use are going to work together. And again, we can, um, you know, help get you in contact with some material houses if there are questions or concerns. Uh, treat your overmold as a separate part. Um, Nominal wall thickness is, is crucial uh, for both the substrate and the overmold. Um, radii for good flow, design flow channels, mechanical holds for the overmold materials to use. Uh, use accent grooves and hard shutoffs to prevent flash and peel. Um, for the overmolds, uh, try to stick to a B3 or a blast finish to prevent sticking. And then for quoting, uh, three separate files, the assembly and the uh, two individual files. Um, lastly, just design it as you dream it. The right manufacturer can make it come to life. Um, we do all kinds of parts. Uh, if you're not sure if it can be made, feel free to reach out. We'll take a look at it, um, let you know, um, or provide some feedback on, on how it can be done. So I think with that, we're going to open up to some questions. If we do, we have several mm -hmm. questions. Okay. Um, do you want the overmolded surface on the substrate to be polished or textured for best chemical adhesion? Again, textured. you want to go with textured. Some <coughs> doesn't have to be heavy depending on the, the overmolded material, but yes, you, you, you do need some sort of texture as a, to, as a grip, if you were. Well, that thing is asking about on the substrate. Oh, okay. Yeah. To, the, the so, yeah, I mean, with you'd want texture, you get more surface area with the texture. So uh, more surface area, you're going to get more adhesion. Um, and the overmolded button example was the button then molded 
after the overmolded seal membrane or was the button simply pushed into the overmold Good. membrane? It was all actually molded at once. So the, the main housing, the outer housing was, uh, here, let me go back to that screen so we can. So the blue part and the green part were loaded into the tool. And then the, the red was shot into that, just basically creating the assembly in, in one shot. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, what are the best practices for choosing gate locations on the overmold? Well, depending on uh, what the part's for, I mean, that a, lot of, a lot of times uh, the customer can't have any vestige shown. So many times we have to come through the backside of the part, do some sort of sub gate, pin gate, uh, to get that plastic through um, to the front. And again, any type of uh, uh, runner track to hit multiple areas that are separated on the substrate that aren't a complete overmold. Those are always good practice. <coughs> uh, will a substrate cause overmold material shrink rate to be affected, causing it to be somewhat restricted from shrinking the normal amount? Yes. And typically, um, when you're overmolding a rubber onto um, onto the outside of a part, you're not really adding much shrink um, because it is going to be restricted. Um, you know, our designers take that into consideration um, depending on on what's being overmolded. Um, so it, it's really going to be part dependent at that point. Um, can you review what makes a good shutoff feature between the substrate and the overmold? I think we may have go back to that page. So kind of in the shutoff area here. Um, yeah, I mean, basically what you what you want to avoid are thin areas leading up to the part edge, or I definitely do not want any type of knife edge. You want you want a good uh, wall thickness that butts up <laughs> clean to the substrate area. Anytime you have thin or, or knife edges, uh, you, you run the risk of, of flashing in that part peeling away, um, just dependent really on the application. But uh, it is important to make sure that your design nominal wall, nominal wall is the key and good radiuses uh, and all of those things uh, will help uh, the overall process function as it should. <coughs> all right, another question here. Roughly speaking, how much does a second overmold tool cost in proportion to the substrate tool? Um, that's going to be really difficult to answer because it's really going to depend on the substrate um, and what the overmold looks like. You may have a substrate that has a lot of um, actions required, you know, external holes or, or, or something that's required for the substrate, and but the overmold may be a simple button like we see there. Um, in that case, the substrate tool will probably be more. Um, in other cases, it, it could be opposite. It's just really going to be design dependent. Um, are there any special considerations when overmolding metals versus plastics? It uh, really depends on the application. We've we've run across across uh, <coughs> uh, metal pieces that required overmold uh, materially to them that are hard, and a lot of times uh, the metal substrate piece uh, needed to be heated before being put into the tool, just as an example, uh, which will allow better bonding with the overmold material. Uh, it's really dependent on the, uh, on the application and the material you're using, but yes, there are, there are definitely things to consider um, when choosing the plastic uh, for the substrate material that you want to cover. All right, last one here. Typically, we want seven degrees on a shutoff feature between core and cavity. Do you need that on the substrate shutoffs? Uh, seven degrees is, is what every designer would love to have, um, uh, depending on the application, uh, two, three, four degrees, depending on any texture, different textures require different uh, drafts. Um, if, if a designer can give us seven degrees, we're very happy to have that for sure. Um, a lot of times that's not allowed uh, <coughs> per the customer specifications, but any, any amount of draft we can get uh, is preferable. All right, looks like we got one more. Um, can you perform a process on the substrate prior to overmolding, such as screen printing? Um, you could. Um, 
but depending where that screen printing may be, uh, it could get, uh, if it's Mar an area of shutoff, you're going to have tool closing on that surface, which could affect it. Um, so just depending yes, on. Yes, it, it, it is possible, but again, it's just going to depend on, on what's being done. Um, and then I think, oop. You want to do one more? Sure. All right. Can you talk to cycle times involved in overmolding? It, again, it's it's pretty much project specific. Um, if it's a large substrate with a very small area, a little grip that's required to be overmolded, uh, that cycle time will be uh, significantly shorter. But again, if you if you've got a large area, it's really dependent on the uh, the amount of the uh, material to be overmolded. Um, that'll dictate uh, the fill process, and that'll dictate your cycle. I know there was a question of uh, what the email address was to get the texture plaques. It's up there on the screen and it's also at our website. Um, so just take note of that and um, we will be emailing a copy out. We will be posting it oh, out to you. That's, your, that's, that's your. okay. That's for you. Well, um, uh, thank you for joining us today for the webinar. We appreciate it. If you have any questions or interest in eccentric products, please visit our website at www.eccentricmold.com. Our social channels are contact us directly um, at the phone number listed on the screen. Um, and also feel free to email us at sales at eccentricmold.com. We're happy to address any questions you may have. We will have this posted out to our website so that you can view it in the future. Um, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks right, everyone. Thank you, everyone.